Ladies and gentlemen, this is Adam Kokish. I'm here today with one of my true heroes, Dr. Mary Ruert. And if you've heard me give a speech about my book, Freedom, you've heard her name before because when I rattle off all of the great libertarian authors who wrote important works and manifestos that get the message across, I always reference her book, Healing Our World in an Age of Aggression. And it's not just one that I can say, oh, it it's, should be on every shelf, because I could say that as well. But it was actually personally impactful for me in my awakening. And my girlfriend, Stacy, who is behind the camera right now, it was one of the first books that I asked her to read after Freedom, and it is impacting her as well. But Dr. Ruert is really a legend within the movement and the party itself. She first ran for the party nomination for president in 1983. I was one year old at the time, just to give you a sense of the timing there. She's aged way better than I have. And she ran again in 2008. But I first met her in 2010, uh, thanks to the Free State Project and Liberty Forum, when she gave a speech about the FDA. And I reference it to this day. And I, I'm going to let her talk, I promise. But it, this, this blew my mind. And, and when, I was a, when I was a baby libertarian myself, it, it was really important for me to hear about her research about the FDA and how by keeping safe drugs or effective drugs off the market and by putting unsafe drugs on the market, it has been directly responsible for tens of millions of deaths. And she has recently released a book, Death by Regulation, that gets into this in more detail. And, and I, I didn't think the numbers could get any scarier, but Dr. Ruert. But they are because each of us have lost five to 10 years of our lives to the 1962 amendments to the Food and Drug Act. And that's pretty bad. And of course, this is a conservative estimate. The reality is we've probably lost more than that. Now, is this the average American, or is this something that you're saying like is inescapable for everybody who lives under the tyranny of the FDA? Well, basically what it is is half the people who have died since 1962 from disease have lost their lives due to the amendments for an average of 11 years. So for us, that means that the average person's lost five and a half years, but I'm only counting what happened to the drug industry. I'm not counting what happened to the prevention industry, which is probably an even bigger number. And, and even the, the drug industry numbers are very conservative. So, you know, we could really be talking about closer to 15 or 20 years. It's a little difficult to tell without more data on prevention. When you think of all the potential of innovation in, in, in healthcare that we have been, this has been, been robbed of us because it's been stifled, it's been held back, it's, I mean, it's been, been deliberately kept away from people because of corrupt pharmaceutical interests, medical industry interests. I mean, it is, it is really mind boggling. But for, for the average person who, who wants to be able to communicate this and substantiate it, aside from saying, hey, Go, go read the book, get the book, and, and this is one I will, I will plug having not read it because I know from the speech and I know from Dr. Ruert's work that the information in here is critical to your understanding of the destructiveness of government. But if, if, I, if I were to tell somebody, no, the FDA has been responsible for tens of millions of deaths, if, when, when someone tells you, or, I, that can't be true, how do, you, how do you back that up? Well, basically, the research from other investigators, when put together, gives these numbers. It's not even my research. It's just pulling together other research. And if you remember that these amendments took the time it takes from a drug to get from the lab bench to the market from four to 14 years, you can see that a lot of people die waiting. Studies show that innovation has decreased at least 50% because drugs are pulled away in late stage development if you count what happens before they even get started, it's probably closer to 80%. But the numbers I use are very conservative because I, I use 50% loss of innovation and say that those innovations were only as good, 25% as good as the ones we have on the market today. So you see how conservative I'm being. And then the FDA kept life-saving information from us. Just aspirin alone. Uh, 1.7 million people have died from not getting that information in a timely manner, and the same goes for a lot of nutrients. It's mind-boggling, I know. I, I, I know. It takes a lot to, make, to, to, to get me in that state, but the FDA and, and the manipulation of the medical industry is really uh, an under-discussed topic, uh, especially among libertarians, when we can just say, no, look, government kills people. By manipulating the medical industry and the food industry, government kills people. It takes years off your life. I mean, I, 
it, it, it really something I wish I wish more libertarians would, would talk about this because for uh, most libertarians the understanding that you know the way that we talk about it is, is relatively shallow like legalize weed because cannabis has you know so many other health benefits you know legalize all drugs because you have the right to put what you want in your own body get reg rid of regulation because regulation is bad but what I've what I've learned in my activism is that most human beings are not like us we're the weirdos you know the, the libertarians the intellectuals the, the ones that have to figure things out intellectually but most human beings are, are rationally ignorant of this and there's a reason for that it's really hidden this all happens behind closed doors and people inside the pharmaceutical industry like I was that saw these amendments grow and metastasize don't dare speak up because the FDA will punish them when I present this information at scientific conventions the scientists come up to me and say oh we are so glad somebody's finally speaking out you know, I would be uh, remiss for my audience because I know we have a lot of veterans and, and active duty military and you know I'm, I'm a veteran combat veteran myself and we have uh, I think a lot more than our share of veterans in this movement because a lot of us are compelled by our military experience from from that to become libertarians and one thing that, that we do talk about a lot is the epidemic of military and veteran suicides now in the military maybe it's a different thing obviously but with the veterans you're out of the military the VA is supposed to be helping you there's no excuse. What do you have, uh, you know, uh, on that? Because you know, the, like, I, like I said, the, the understanding that we have is relatively shallow. Legalize weed so that we can get the symptomatic treatment. Legalize MDMA therapy so that you can have that, you know, control therapy. Uh, psilocybin, of course, promising benefits. But what would you say that getting rid of the FDA, ending the drug war, would have as an impact on those issues? Well, let's just use one example. The Department of Defense, in this year's budget, proposed that they be allowed to give veterans, especially those in combat, um, drugs that aren't approved by the FDA. They wanted the approval power and the reason was that the FDA has dragged their feet on approving plasma in plastic bags for combat use. You know, on the battlefield you don't want glass, but that's the only thing that uh, the De Department of Defense can get and they have to get it from France because the FDA hasn't approved the manufacturer in the US who wants to put it in plastic bags and so, said it was so, so just just to be clear, the FDA is the FDA is not just killing Americans the FDA is not just killing veterans the FDA is actually making it harder to save lives on the battlefield that is correct. And, and there, it was so bad, like I said, the, the Department of Defense, another government agency, said, hey, we want to be able to approve drugs for our soldiers so we can save their lives, and the FDA is dragging their feet, so we want to take this approval power away. Now, they didn't get it passed, <laughs> but we'll see if the FDA actually comes forward and takes care of their concerns. I doubt they will, but they promised they would talk. Is it primarily the pharmaceutical industry that's keeping this racket going? No, actually, it's, it's really interesting. Um, it's, the pharmaceutical industry has been really hit hard by these regulations, as well as the prevention industry. The problem is most people don't realize that the cost of the regulations goes up every year, and it goes up exponentially, which means it's going up quite a bit every year. And if you look at the prices that we pay at the pharmacy for new drugs and plot it against the cost of these regulations to the drug company, you see there's a straight line. There's a direct correlation here. So the drug companies are having to charge a lot of money for their drugs because if they don't, they're going to go out of business because the regulatory costs go up every year. And it really distorts the market, not only in a cost manner, but in the way the pharmaceutical companies do business. Because it used to be they would try to put something on the market that you took for a few weeks. But they can't do that anymore if they want to actually survive financially. They try to put things on the market that you'll take for a lifetime. This makes it much more dangerous because your body can handle something for a few weeks, even a few months. But a few decades? No, oh, that's asking a lot for your body. I, I, even just, pro I'm, I'm like, you know, because we, we, oh, it's it's the corporations corrupting the government, using the government. It's just, and it's like, no, that's that's not even the whole story. No, it is the whole story. I mean, obviously, there are times when regulations are put into place because the corporate interests want it. Right. But before these amendments were passed, there were a lot of complaints from the pharmaceutical industry, and when they did pass, there were a lot of lawsuits because 
basically the FDA was taking things off the market because it didn't feel like it met these new requirements and not giving companies time to actually do the studies. So what, what has happened, at least I saw this in the company I worked for, it used to be scientists were the ones who took on the management responsibilities, but once these costs came about, then uh, people who were very financially astute were the ones that were put in management positions so they could tell us, the scientists, you can't develop anything that doesn't have a patent because we won't make enough money. You know, you can't develop this drug because the market is too small. We won't make, you know, our development costs back. And as development costs went up, this happened even more. So is the money just going into the bureaucratic black holes and the wasteful development and approval processes and all that? There's no it's really just an out-of-control federal agency. That's right. The short answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, right. and the of course, um, you can get into the details. Uh, there have been a lot of Band-Aids, legislative Band-Aids, put on the amendments to try to fix the problems it causes because, you know, drug companies don't want to develop anything for short-term use anymore. So there's some Band-Aids that were put on legislatively. But, of course, the more Band-Aids they put on, basically more regulations, the worse the situation gets. Wouldn't it be great if America had just one political party that, that they could they could support, that they could vote for, that would that would get rid of the FDA? Well, they can, and that's the Libertarian Party, of course. So I, I'm sure your listeners are well aware that you're a Libertarian and I'm a Libertarian, but really we all want the same thing, no matter if we're Libertarian or not. We want to live long and healthy lives. We want to be peaceful and prosperous. And with these regulations, they're actually killing us. And they're not just killing us libertarians, they're killing regulators. They're killing Congress. They are killing pharmaceutical executives who might think the system works for them. So it's killing everybody. And once there's a recognition of this, I think there's hope that we can change it because we're all affected. We're all human beings before we're anything else. All right, what's your website and where can people get your book? My website is ruart.com, R-U. WART.com, just like my name, and the book is available at my website or on Amazon, where it has hit uh, a couple bestseller marks in the last few days. Awesome. Congratulations. And I do want to hold this up. If you would hold up Healing Our World, I want to get a shot of both of these. And this is the 2015 edition of Healing Our World, which the subtitle changes every time I have a new edition. This one is The Compassion of Libertarianism. Beautiful. You know, I used to say that this was, well, Thank you very much. Right? Thank you to YouTube for hosting this video and for being an essential part of human progress by making video hosting available worldwide to everyone on the internet. However, the next phase in human progress is here with Steemit.com and their video hosting alternative blockchain-based solutions, including DTube. And you can find that through Steemit.com as well as my own page there, at Adam Kokesh. This is a decentralized blockchain-based social media network that pays you fairly for your content. Already, I'm regularly making more there with a single post than I do from an entire month on YouTube. So please join us on the next frontier of the information revolution at steamit.com. And if you want help getting a leg up there, I'm happy to re-steam your posts and make sure that no one is starting from scratch. Just email me one of your favorite posts at adam at and we'll share it on my feed.